as you know, CEOs, business leaders are immensely uncomfortable about asking uh, uh, governments for anything unless it's um, on the defensive side. They, they feel the less government uh, often the better, but that's changing. And I think there have been a number of experiments where uh, groupings of CEOs and, uh, have come together to think about climate change and to try and influence um, governments. And I think in, in, in um, uh, Rio, uh, for the Rio Plus 20 event, it would have been great if you had seen a number of the different business coalitions come together. I'd like to see, and probably it's naive or romantic, I'd like to see the NGOs starting to do something uh, similar as well. So coming with um, uh, aligned uh, uh, agendas that they've worked on uh, in advance to a greater degree than I think happens now, because that's what business leaders often need to give them the confidence. It, it, it doesn't get us from where we are to where we need to be in a straight, comfortable, happy line. It goes through an immense uh, period of economic uh, and political discontinuity. And that's where I think we are. In fact, um, in 2008, uh, we published a report called The Phoenix Economy. And basically what we were saying was, this is not a recession. This is one of those periodic moments where the global economy, in different uh, speeds and different places, go th goes through a period of uh, meltdown and then something new uh, uh, comes through. So I, I think that's where we're headed, uh, and I don't think the answer to your question is uh, we can decide to suddenly be sustainable. That's not what's going to happen. I think we're going to be forced to think about uh, energy security, about food security, about water security, about climate security. No accident that that sort of language is starting to come uh, in. Genuinely, I, I, I think the human being has to go through a period of really quite deep strain and struggle to, to be prepared to abandon some of the things that worked in the past and to some degree embrace some of the things that we will need uh, for the future. It's funny, if, if I think about Brazil and its future, I think you are incredibly well positioned, not because of oil or gas fields or, or hydropower or whatever, but because I think that you have uh, as you uh, all well know, natural resources like Amazonia, which are just absolutely critical uh, at a global level. So you have an incredible opportunity to, to, to sort of develop uh, some of the industries that will play into that sort of space. I don't yet see the level of innovative thinking that would give me the confidence that that's where Brazil is headed. And the reason why I think it's important is I think only if Brazil develops that sort of range of industrial sectors, will you, to go back to Bavan's discussion around value and price, as a nation come to value, well, the, the, the eight or nine countries that, that, that collectively um, own um, and operate Amazonia, will they collectively come to a valuation which uh, guarantees uh, that global resource um, a future? So I, I, I think you're sitting on what uh, could actually be to use a, a very old world uh, um, um, description, a gold mine. But I don't, I don't see people yet quite responding in the way that I would hope. When the world seems to be going crazy outside and you don't know what the answers are going to be, and when voters um, are, are pressuring you to do the old thing, because that's what they uh, know. So I don't think it's any accident that leaders now are becoming followers, as, you know, as, as we've heard it. Uh, described. But one of the things that history teaches you is that extraordinary times call forth extraordinary leaders. And, and, and I think in the next five or ten years, we're going to see, not just in the business community, uh, but in, in, in the world of politics, a very different breed uh, of leaders uh, uh, springing up. Some of them will be younger, some of them will just be uh, different. I'm quite aware that anything I say in a room like this uh, will go public. Um, I'm going to say things that are politically incorrect. So if you don't want to hear, block your ears. Um, I've been to China a number of times. Uh, the first time I went there, I was virtually kidnapped 
by a member of the government, a state environment minister, who basically took me away for a day and tried to squeeze me like a lemon for everything I knew, knew about the environment, which wasn't very much. Um, and the reason was, um, he was desperate to have new ways of addressing some of the intense um, uh, environmental pressures, particularly environmental pressures that the country is wrestling with, around deforestation, around soil loss, around water degradation, around air quality problems, uh, and so on. If I look at Africa, I see a predator. I see China being a, a natural resource predator. Um, I see the same potentially in Latin America and in Brazil as well, although you're better governed and regulated to some degree uh, than most of the African countries into which China is going. I think in the next five to ten years, people are going to wake up. And it's not that the West, it's not that Europe and North America and so on aren't, aren't intense resource predators as well, but the scale of what China will be doing and the degree to which what it is doing is absent, it doesn't have the same levels of transparency and so on that uh, operators from other parts of the world do have. So if you hear me being slightly confused, um, you do, I really like being in China, I like the people, I like the sort of the vibrancy and the energy there. But if, if just a, a, a mental game, imagine 50% of Brazil being owned by China overnight. If I think about 50% of Europe being owned by China overnight, I think it's a horrible prospect for all sorts of different reasons. Now, it would be nice if it weren't. And if you remember when Japan was exploding out into the wider world and buying up large parts of the United States, uh, you know, Rockefeller Center and uh, Hollywood Studios and so on, people were nervous uh, then. I think we should be even more nervous at this stage uh, uh, about China. But 10 years from now, I think it may be a very different uh, uh, um, situation. I think, I think the country is going to come up with a very rapid uh, learning curve. Let's hope so. If that was politically incorrect, I apologize. I suppose the idea that's behind the new book is simple, and I, I referenced it in a way in, in, in my early comments. Although I'm very proud of what the environmental movement, of what the sustainability movement, of what the corporate social responsibility movement, and all of these different movements have done to date, and we use language that we would not have used 15 or 20 years ago. We do things like reporting that we wouldn't have done uh, certainly 20 years ago. I'm worried. And I'm worried not simply because of what I described about China. I'm worried because of demographic trends, population, uh, and so on. And I think if you take, and it's back to that Accenture study for the Global Compact. I think if you add up all of the things that we're doing and as optimists, uh, imagine what might happen over the next 15 to 20 years. It really is not going to make the grade. And so my simple message to Rio Plus 20, to this audience, to myself, um, is we've got to really start to use new benchmarks. We've really got to challenge ourselves as to whether what we're doing is change as usual or whether it has the capacity to break through to something quite different. And I will hear a lot of speakers uh, over these few days talking about breakthrough, but I think we've got to be very, very much more rigorous in assessing whether uh, whatever we're working on has a real chance to change the world. More and more people use that. I want to change the world. It's meaningless. The question is, what's your theory of change? How are you going to do it? How will you know whether it's worked or it hasn't? Uh -huh.